So let's get started. So this morning will be a very interesting presentation by James Brousseau. He's the director of ethics site at Pace University. James has a PhD in philosophy. He's an author of books, articles, digital media, in the history of philosophy and ethics. He is taught in Europe, Mexico, and currently at Pace University, where he lives here in New York. And James is going to be talking about a, a bit of a, an ethical dilemma as it relates to AI within, within finance. Welcome, James, to the stage. Thanks for coming out this morning after last night. Um, let's see, some of the people who were with us with dinner last night have made it back, so that's, that's good. Um, yesterday, uh, we saw a few papers about explainability of artificial intelligence and the endeavor or effort to understand artificial intelligence. And about that effort, um, I don't think that it's wrong. And I don't believe that it's misguided to try to understand the mechanisms of artificial intelligence. I do, however, believe that it is insane. And the reason I think that uh, starts with this old ad from more than 20 years ago now, a uh, very successful campaign, the uh, priceless campaign for MasterCard. Um, all of us have seen one or another version of this ad. It all has the same sort of structure. There are some things that you can buy with cash, and then it culminates with something that presumably can't be purchased with money, something that is priceless. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is try to think a little bit about what priceless means. And the ad itself um, presents the first reading. Uh, it sort of begins with $45 for the dance lessons, $64 for the wine, $138 for the shoes. So there's this natural escalation of prices, right? There's this idea um, that priceless could mean some amount of money, uh, some very large amount of money, uh, perhaps so much that we can't count it or reach it, but it still is some amount. It's connected to the previous prices, 45, 64, 138, and then way up there, some very high price. Maybe there's too many zeros on this price for it to fit on the print ad. So that's one way of thinking about priceless, just as an extremely large number of dollars. Uh, but I don't think that's what they were going for. Um, I think that the, what they were going for was something different. Right? I think what they were trying to say is uh, that the dance you could have to see off your son at his wedding, uh, that's something which cannot be reduced to a dollar value. That's something in which it doesn't make sense, sense to talk about it in terms of dollars and cents. Um, to put a price on this dance is something that is sometimes called a category mistake. A category mistake uh, occurs when you try to understand or have an experience with tools that don't fit that experience. So a simple example of a category mistake is, uh, can you see the color of that sound? Well, no, you can't. Uh, I could stand here for two hours, two years, two centuries, squinting out at what's around me, and I would never see the color of a sound. Right? So asking to see the color of a sound, that's a category mistake. And something like that is, I think, what they mean by priceless. Asking to put a dollar value on this dance, it's a category mistake. And then one last thing, it's worth noting quickly that even though it's true that I could never see sound, it's not at all difficult to imagine 
see and sound. Right? It's not at all difficult to imagine a creature which was almost like us um, and which would look out just as I am looking at all of you. And if someone dropped a glass over there, let's say, I would see the faces and the commotion, but then I would also see kind of a, like a red firework, right, with this loud sound. And then if people were whispering over on this side, I might see their outline and then a kind of a blue cloud where they, representing the sound of their whispers, and as they stopped whispering, the cloud would dissipate. So it's not at all difficult to imagine or even to fool ourselves into thinking that we can see sound but we can't, and it's something near crazy to try. Two minutes, two hours, two years, two centuries, squinting, looking, it won't happen. Okay, so I want to say that the idea of priceless that, I, that we will start with today, um, and that I'm going to want to apply to uh, finance in general, is this idea that there are different categories of experience that are not relatable to each other. They cannot be bridged, they cannot be connected. To try to connect them, to try to bridge them, is like trying to see the, co the color of sound. Okay. Um, so I want to say that further, with respect to AI and big data in finance, uh, that pricing, loan, tar loan targeting, risk estimation, and so on, the kinds of things you are all involved in, um, all of those things, when they occur within a big data AI environment are priceless. That is, they occur within a different logic than the traditional, or with the, with the tools of a different logic than the tools we conventionally use. And the attempt to try to understand or think about AI and big data finance with the conventional tools is as fruitless and as hopeless as trying to see sound. Okay. So that's, that's the premise of what I want to put forward. Um, I have two, two quick examples. Um, this one, The Making of a Fly, is a perfectly normal book, common. I'm not sure if it's hardcover or softcover, but there's nothing special about it. And this is a true screenshot. Somehow it happened that the two copies of this book that were available ended up being priced at 23 million and change and 18 million dollars and change. So how did this happen? Well, a biology professor who actually wanted to buy the book saw the price tag said, you know, I think I'll wait. Um, he sort of watched the price uh, day after day to see what was going on. How did it get this high? And he saw that, actually, he started watching before the price reached this extreme. Um, so he sort of marked down what the prices were each day, and then backwards engineered what was happening. Here's what was happening. Uh, there were two people selling this book on Amazon. Um, but the fact is, only one person had a copy. That's the $18 million man. So he set up, or she set up, um, an algorithm to price this copy of the book as the lowest price available on Amazon. Uh, and lower, not by a certain dollar amount, this wouldn't have happened in that case. Instead, it was lower by a certain percentage. So it makes sense, right? The person has a book, they want to sell the book, they program their um, machine to go through, read everything that's available on Amazon, and put their book at the lowest price. The other guy, he had a little bit more sophisticated strategy, uh, or a little bit more postmodern. He said, look, I want to sell the book, but I don't actually want to have copies. So here's what I'm going to do. Right? I want to sell the book with no warehouse, no books at all. Uh, pure money. Uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to scan Amazon, and I'm going to find the lowest price book, and then I'm going to set a price for that same book, which is a certain percentage higher. And if someone comes in and buys the book from me, I'm immediately going to buy the book from this other person and just have them send it straight out to my customer. Makes sense, right? No mess, they make money. So everything is going just the way it should. But of course, the lower price book 
and the higher price book are here. The lower price book senses the higher price book above it and says, you know, I've got some room to move up. I'll still be the lowest price. This one senses the next day that this one has moved up, goes up, and because we're talking percentages, it exploded. And we end up with $23 million and $18 million. Now, the one point I want to make here is that nothing went wrong. Everything happened just the way it was supposed to happen. The machines performed perfectly. Sometimes uh, if you read, if you look this up on Google, you'll find articles about it. And you will read frequently the article headline is, um, pricing on Amazon goes off the rails. No, it didn't. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. Nothing was off the rails, nothing was irregular, nothing was wrong. This is what's supposed to happen, and that's what happened. This is my favorite uh, part of that <laughs> sale. Right? Comedy um, is notoriously difficult to define. Uh, but one of the definitions of comedy traces back loosely to Aristotle's poetics is that comedy happens when you have simultaneously something which is quotidian, reasonable, normal, and something which is absurd, silly. You have to have them simultaneously in the same place, jammed together. I mean, if you have something that's normal, quotidian, reasonable, that's boring. Right? No one cares about that. If you have something that's silly and ridiculous, that's also boring. If you have children, try watching Teletubbies. Silly, ridiculous, and very boring. Right? So, silly things are boring, normal things are boring. Um, but the comedy happens when they're mashed up, right? when they're together. It's like TNT, inert ingredients. But when you put them together, that's when you get the laughter. So, that's what happened here, right? We have something that's reasonable, normal, and something that's silly and absurd. Now, I have a question for you. Which is which? Wh which part is silly and absurd, and which part is reasonable and normal? It depends on how you see it, right? From the point of view of the algorithms, which worked perfectly and did just what they were supposed to do, what's absurd is throwing in this extra 399 charge. That makes no sense. Contrarily, from the point of view of conventional marketing on Amazon, $3.99 is perfectly reasonable, but $23 million for a book, not so much. So there you have, as a footnote, philosophers call this pure difference. Uh, but for our purposes, there you have insanity, right? looking across one number at the other. In both cases, the number Self-referentially makes sense, but what is seen the other way doesn't, it, it, is, it, it, it is not sensible, it is not rational. It doesn't fit with the logic of the other. So this is an example of what I mean by priceless finances, a world where you have matched up realities that, that cannot be made congruent, that cannot cohere. They're right next to each other, but they cannot touch, they cannot make sense, the one to the other. Here's another example. Um, I show this one. All of us have seen once in a while these uh, crazy correlations that come up where if the price of rice in Bangkok goes down, the stock market goes up, those kinds of things. Well, this is one of the originals. Um, this is a guy named J.P. Martin in Canada. The year was 2002. Uh, he was working at a company called Ca Canadian, or yes, I believe it's Canadian Tire. And those Canadians have some crazy tire stores. Their tire store also sold all kinds of other items, and they had their own credit card and so on. And so he had a lot of data on his hands uh, and some time in the winter, I suppose. And he went through and he found out that people who bought these rubber scratch protectors to protect the floor from scratches in the kitchen, um, extraordinarily good credit risks. And he followed this through an economic cycle and found that this correlation performed better than the traditional tools. 
So, and of course, all of us are familiar now with this. This was 2002, though. Um, and what I want to say here, and I'm going to use this sort of as the launching point for the next step. What I want to say here is this is one of the first cases uh, where we have seen decisions made without asking why. The only way this will work, the only way you will give credit cards to people because they purchased these scratch floor protectors, the only way that will work is if you don't ask why. I mean, as soon as you ask that, as soon as you say, wait a minute, what's the connection? Why is it that we should trust someone who just buys these floor scratch things with that huge credit line? As soon as you ask that question, the whole thing falls apart. Because you say, well, there's no reason. So we're not going to do that. Forget it. But he didn't ask why. And so they raised the credit lines. And it worked. So not asking why is critical. And it's very critical for today's nonlinear big data artificial intelligence functioning. The whole thing will collapse if you ask why. I think, let me show you why I think that. Um, this is a debate uh, that's happening right now. It's one of the few times as a philosopher that I get to participate in something which is actually happening contemporaneously. Usually our debates are about what was going on in Greece or something, um, ancient Greece, I mean. Uh, this is a debate between um, Rob Kitchen on your right, who is a professor in Ireland, and Chris Anderson on your left, who is the former editor of Wired Magazine and now runs, I believe, a robot uh, company. I'm fudging their debate a little bit for our purposes. Uh, but one way of thinking about their different points of view um, is that Rob Kitchen defends the view that we saw yesterday uh, espoused by some of our presenters. That is that we can understand in one or another way how artificial intelligence works. We can explain it. Chris Anderson is on my side. He says no. And the reason he and I say no is because and this is sort of the heart of what I want to say. In order for human beings to understand anything, in order for human beings to understand, we need to apply a kind of frame on our experience, which is something like cause and effect, or hypotheses and deductions, or in the language some of you use, some kind of linear progression. We need reasons why. Without that, we cannot understand. Let me, let me give you an example. Um, think about, let's go back to our example of sight. Uh, when I look out at you, I see tables, I see faces, I see cans of um, soda pop and computers and briefcases. I see all those things. But what my eyes perceive is none of that. What my eyes perceive is just blotches of color, right? That's what my eyes get, nothing but color. There is all this other work that is happening in my brain, without me even thinking about it, which takes these blotches, uh, takes this man here and says, well, there's the color of the name tape, the color of the suit, the color of the glasses, and somehow unites that and separates it out from the very similar color of the table and the chairs. My brain is doing all that. And if it, my brain did not do that, I would not see anything. Of course, I would get little splotches of color, but it would be meaningless, madness, like an LSD dream, just color with no, no sense. So in order for me to see, my brain needs to strap a kind of structure on these colors that come, that come into my eyes. The same thing is true with comprehension. In order for me to understand the things that are happening in the world, my brain needs to strap on or put a frame of cause and effect around that, or hypotheses and deductions. It's not clear exactly what this frame is. We're at the limit. Here, we're at the very limits of human understanding, right? We're trying to understand ourselves. 
So it's not clear exactly what this frame is, but it's there. And if this frame is a kind of cause and effect frame, if it's a linear reasoning frame, then how could we possibly understand a system, even though it may be called artificial intelligence, how could we possibly understand a system which doesn't work that way, which is a non-linear process? Here's a sort of case study, right? So you can imagine, and this is one of the things that drives everybody crazy, right? The, all the cars squeezing onto this one lane, and there's this inviting escape path there. Right? You're just dying to go down that escape to get off this traffic jam. Well, do you do it? Well, if you're a human being, the answer to that question is, well, it depends on where I'm going. It's why. Why would I do it or why would I not do it? Artificial intelligence and big data work differently, at least those parts of it which work through correspondence, that is, which work in the way we saw those floor scratch protectors. Artificial intelligence says, if people who like the Mission Impossible movies, give that five stars, tend to give five stars to the Bruce Willis Die Hard movies, and I watch a Mission Impossible movie and give it five stars last weekend, when I sit down this weekend to watch a movie, what is Netflix going to recommend? But we know what it's going to recommend, not because Netflix answered the question, why? Netflix doesn't care why one person likes, why people who like Mission Impossible also like the Die Hard movies. That makes no difference. All they care is that the correspondence is there. And stronger, stronger, stronger. It's not just that correspondence, and here it would be, well, if the cars always squeeze left, every time there's a car there, it squeeze left, so what is artificial intelligence going to tell you to do? If you're in a car there, you squeeze left. That's it. There is no why. It's not just that that's what happens, but there is this crucial point. The fact that the artificial intelligence process creates this recommendation, whether it's a movie or a direction you drive, the fact that it creates that without bothering to think about why the connection is there is the source of the strength and the power of big data and artificial intelligence. That's why it works. And that's why we want it. Because it skips all the busyness, all the heavy lifting of why. Just, we don't need why. Let's just go straight to A, B, A, B. We've got an A, therefore B. Let's go straight to it. That's the speed, that's the efficiency, that's the power. And that's precisely also what makes it incomprehensible to us. So it's a strange situation. Exactly that thing which gives big data and artificial intelligence its power is also that thing which makes it impenetrable for our minds. It is therefore insane for us to try to understand it. If we did, if we did understand it, if we made it explainable, we could only ruin it. We must, because what makes it work to begin with is the fact that there are no explanations. There is no why. That's the power and the reason. Okay. So that's the core idea that I would like to present this morning. This idea that we can't understand, we can't explain, we can't make it comprehensible, not because it's really hard, not because if I just had more time and more help, I might be able to study long enough to figure it out. No, it's not that. We can't possibly understand because it is a different logic. And if we did understand, we would ruin it anyway. It is, it is as difficult and impossible as seen sound. So, the black box question. Uh, we heard quite a bit about this yesterday, this concern that, well, AI and big data are a black box. It's not a black box. It's a black hole. And it must be a black hole because once you get in, you can't possibly get out. Since getting in means giving up the ability to think 
in the way that we recognize or understand thinking to work. And all this then, wrapping this up, uh, relates to a question, very important set of questions that we talked about yesterday. Uh, there is, at this moment, a very large push uh, to create transparency, accountability, um, understanding, explainability, uh, excuse me, a big push to get explainability and understanding of artificial intelligence so that we can get accountability. That is, if we don't know um, how something happened, it can't be anybody's fault. So if we're going to let AI make decisions, we've got to know how the machine worked so that we can say someone is to blame when something went wrong. So in this picture we have um, on the left, there's the fairly new conference, the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency. That's a CES conference. We have the Wall Street Journal and Capital One. Uh, we have uh, someone, uh, the leader of the AI Now Institute, right down the street, uh, saying the AI industry urgently needs accountability and transparency. It needs transparency so that it can get accountability. And what I have tried to present today in this segment of the morning program is a simple question. What if we can't understand? What if the condition of the possibility of having artificial intelligence and big data processes is that we can't possibly make sense of them? Then what? And I think, this is the final thought, I think that, we can rephrase the question, um, that we'll be faced with the possibility that we cannot make AI work with our particular rules of reason, I think that this will be a dilemma that faces us in the near future. Right? The dilemma is not what everyone thinks it is. The dilemma is not how can we understand this AI? How can we make it understandable? That's not the dilemma. The dilemma is whether or not we are going to use it knowing that we can't understand it. So this is the new dilemma. But as a final thought, I think it's also one of the oldest. There are all kinds of things we do that we don't understand, like dancing. Thanks for having me.